previous conference, we were reviewing a traditional practice in the Christian tradition for developing our sensitivity to God's action and presence in our lives. A sensitivity that involved an increasing capacity to listen to the Word of God, as it appears in the sacred texts, at ever deepening level or refinement of our receptive faculties. Um, what are you doing when you're listening? Nothing. You're just listening. And you're offering your whole attention to hopefully this conference if you're listening to me. The same kind of attentiveness is being developed but at a deepening level when we read the scriptures or the sacred text of the Gospels in this attitude, this disposition of alert receptivity. As we saw, uh, we're not trying to learn something or to get information, but insight. That is to say, a penetration of the text. And this penetration becomes more lively and deeper as uh, love develops. And hence, uh, St. Gregory the Great's uh, well-known description of contemplative prayer as the penetrating knowledge of God or the knowledge of God that is made penetrating through love, a tasting knowledge of God. Now, uh, when we speak of tasting God, obviously this doesn't mean sinking your teeth into him. He, d he doesn't have <laughs> body or senses to relate to. We have to learn to relate to him at his level of relating, which, which is a little more spiritual. In any case, when, when uh, our tradition speaks of the spiritual senses, they're referring to spiritual experiences which are like ex the external senses. But not, they aren't the ex external senses in the sense that we're not actually touching or hearing or, or, or seeing God. We are perceiving God as if <laughs> these senses had a spiritual counterpart in our spiritual nature. And so when uh, the Psalms, for instance, say, taste and see how sweet the Lord is, this tasting refers to the highest of the spiritual senses, which uh, it is comparable to tasting insofar as when you eat something, you take it inside of you. And so to taste God simply means then that one is experiencing God inside. And so the, as our reflections and spontaneous prayer simplifies in the periods of, of Lexio or reading the book we believe to be divinely inspired, the moments of resting in God begin to accumulate. But this rest mustn't be understood <laughs> As, as a kind of uh, lying on the floor or sitting on a mattress or something or on a cushion. It, it's a rest that is much deeper and that comes from a freedom from the emotional programs, hang-ups, strain, tension, residue of traumatic experiences from early life that are uh, lingering in our unconscious or in our nervous system and, and which cause us to be agitated in one form or another. And, and when our, our interior programs for emotional happiness of one kind or another, uh, which can't possibly work, are gradually laid to rest, then one experiences inwardly much more peace and these uh, experiences of resting in God, tasting God, 
loving God can become more frequent during the time of prayer and they also begin to overflow into the rest of life. We were speaking of a period of reading the scripture in this receptive manner that might last a half an hour or 45 minutes longer if you had the time, and which began with the reading but was easily moved into reflection or spontaneous prayer and sometimes into resting in God even in the same period of prayer so that one could kind of go up and down the ladder of the faculties from what was most exterior to what was most interior, this tasting of God, and, and then backwards again. So that it, it, it was a very organic kind of relating, very much as we saw like relating to a living person whom we know uh, in, among our friends. Now the Middle Ages developed a, a, a kind of teaching on the on, on Christian consciousness and the development of higher levels of Christian faith and love that were called the four senses of Scripture. Four ways, in other words, of understanding or listening to the Word of God. Four levels of interiorizing that Word or of assimilating it and of being assimilated into it. Uh, the principle being the deeper the impression, the greater the response. And so the more deeply the Word of God resonated at the deepest level of our being, which happens to be interior silence, the more complete and total was the self-surrender, the response, and eventually the action in the service of the gospel, which is in the service of the human family. Remember, it's the, it's the human family as a whole that Jesus is trying to save. Okay. So that in getting involved in that project has some hazards for physical life and limb. I'd like to just go through those quickly because it, it reinforces, I think, this idea of prayer as relationship. The literal sense, of course, of Scripture is, is the examples, the parables, the explicit teaching of Jesus insofar as we can find this out from hermeneutics, the study of the text and words, meaning of words, language, skills, uh, etc. Now, uh, as we read the text over and over again, on a regular basis, remember this is our interview, our encounter, our heavy date with Christ that we try every day unless there's some great reason of charity or, or, uh, or some pressing need or illness or some, something else. We, we try to make our, our engagement. We try to be present. We try to, to, to manifest our sincerity by the effort of giving that encounter a high and perhaps the highest priority in our way of life. Now, when this has been done for a while, you begin to want to put into practice what you've read. Its beauty, its attractiveness, the freedom, the responsibility, the human growth, the spiritual growth to which the gospel is constantly inviting us makes us want to do something about it. The parables really are, are marvelous wisdom sayings, actually more like the teachings of the Zen master than of the rabbis in whose actual traditional line Jesus uh, was in. He, he diverged from the usual way of rabbinical teaching. That's why people said, who is this guy? He teaches as someone with authority. The rabbis, of course, spoke in the synagogue on the subject of the Old Testament, the scriptures, and, uh, and there were a number of, of, of rules and laws, observances, that they were expected to follow in their teaching. It was a fairly stereotyped exposition of the scripture 
based on a traditional way of teaching. Well, along comes Jesus and he didn't teach in the synagogue. He, he didn't teach on the basis of the scripture. Rarely does he use the scripture as a basis for his, his talk. He exercises this freedom and he doesn't quote the, the scripture so much for his authority as he simply tells it how it is, as he sees it. Okay. And this naturally caused some consternation among the, the, uh, his, his peers, the other rabbis of the time who couldn't figure out what he was doing. He deliberately was outside of the traditional way of teaching. And he offer is, the basis of his teaching are these wonderful parables which are not moralistic, but which are designed to shake the value system of his hearers, whether they be the ordinary farmers or the businessmen in the towns or the religious leaders or the Roman soldiers if they happen to be listening. And thus his, his, uh, his teaching is, is to upset your ordinary expectation of what the point or the end of the story is going to be so that you have a space uh, or are shocked, so to speak, into a new way of seeing reality. A classical example is the Good Samaritan. Well, the Samaritans were the bad guys in those days. Uh, they were kind of heretics. Uh, they were looked down upon by the Israelites uh, for various historical reasons. They were the scum of the earth, so to speak. Now, in this parable, the respectable people, the, the priest and the rabbi, are going down to Jericho, or up to Jericho, I forget which it was, and, and here's a guy who's been beaten up by robbers by the road. Well, they carefully avoid getting anywhere near the body writhing there on the ground. They don't want to get involved. Along comes this Samaritan, the despised people in the, in the minds, sets of the hearers, and he picks the guy up, binds up his wounds with oil, takes him to an inn, uh, pays for his fare, and tells the uh, innkeeper if, it, if he charges, if there's more expenses, I'll pay for it. And then the question, which of these was neighbor to the guy who was beat up by robbers. The point of the story is not so much to help your neighbor, because that, uh, uh, if that was the case, the, 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 uh, instead of being a Samaritan, it could have been the Levite or priest who picked him up. So there's another point to the story, much more profound than the one that it tends to be usually presented in homilies. Of course we love our neighbor, but that's not the point of this story. The point of this story is that the people you think and I think are a bunch of bums may be the best people there are, and, and the people we think are tops may be a pain in, in a certain place for God. So, so don't be too sure of your judgments. That's the, answer. That's the point of that story. So Jesus doesn't make any moral. He just says, why don't you think about your value system? It might not be so hot. <laughs> it might be, not be the last word. And so some of the parables are, are deliberately uh, surprising and, 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 and meant to shake you up. And uh, the kingdom of heaven, he says, is like uh, someone who found a treasure in a field. He was so happy. He went and sold everything he had and bought that field. That's all. But he, he, he's saying that if you listen to my words, it's going to change your life, for better or for worse. That's the invitation, to be open to change. And, and so again and again, all through the parables, Jesus is, is deliberately sort of putting an earthquake under the mindsets of the people in that town, uh, of that town shaking the ground under them so that they might be free to hear the gospel. One of the great problems to listening is that we've got something else going on in our heads or our ears are full of wax or something else. Empty your ears, says Jesus, and hear what I'm saying. He says again and again, remember to those, the apostles and others, if anybody has ears to hear, let them hear, implying that people were not hearing what he was saying 
at least not at the level to which he was re- at, directing. So Jesus directs, addresses his teaching at ever deepening levels. And we pick it up where we are in our present capacity to hear without preconceived ideas, prepackaged value systems, and other things that consciously or unconsciously prevent us from hearing. Now, when he was on the road to Jerusalem and trying to tell the disciples that he was going to be killed and rise again on the third day, they didn't know what he was talking about. But that was plain plain Aramaic, wasn't it? (laughs) Judge for yourself. (laughs) They couldn't hear it because they wouldn't hear it. That's why most people do not hear the gospel. They don't want to hear its consequences, its implications, the fact that it might change their prejudices of one kind or another, their mindsets. And so the gospel is read Sunday after Sunday, nobody hears it. Not in the sense that Christ wants it to be heard, which with our heart and our inmost being, with openness to change and surrender to the new values that the gospel introduces. And those values are revolutionary in any society because society and culture tend to reinforce the false self-system. That seems to be the purpose of culture, to prevent us from hearing the truth and especially the Word of God, the purity of the Gospel, inviting us to life and the fullness of love and, incidentally, to to saving this poor world of ours before it blows itself up. Society is just the the accumulation of our own junk insofar as we haven't dismantled our programs for happiness that are selfish and self-centered. Culture reinforces those projects. The gospel challenges them head on. So if all we hear is the gospel proclaimed Sunday after Sunday without its going through our heart, in other words, if it goes one through one ear and through our brain and out the other, it's useless. And we need to read those parables carefully to realize that this is not Christianity. This is just like hearing any other subject, whether it's (laughs) bird watching philosophy or anything else. What goes through your head goes out. What goes through your heart changes you. That's the level that is beginning to come into focus when we decide to put this teaching into practice. Of course, when you do, you find out it's not so easy, and so it's a little embarrassing. It reflects back on our selfishness, and that's not so nice. So so most people don't keep this up too long. Hence the parable of the seed that fall, that is scattered out on the ground and falls on different kinds of ground, meaning different kinds of hearing apparatus. And some falls on hard ground and it never gets rooted and hence it never grows. Some falls among thorns, worldly cares and preoccupations, it doesn't grow up very long. Some falls on narrow soil or thin soil, grows up quickly and then withers. Percentage doesn't sound too good, does it? Twenty-five percent is <laughs> of those who hear the Word of God begin to bear some fruit, and for them it's 30, 40, 80 or something. So uh, just as nature is so casual about what seed actually develops, and and nature provides an enormous quantity of seed and potentiality for life, much, much more than we need. Think how many acorns fall to the ground, maybe one shoot out of 100,000 or whatever it is. Well, it's even higher in the case of, 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 uh, of procreation. Well, anyway, here, 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 here we are with this teeming capacity for life and only a few, uh, uh, it takes only here and there. The same is true of the gospel. It has this enormous energy for life, its incredible potentiality for divine union, develop, growth. It's a process, 
But because the process is so precarious in the beginning, it's subject to the same hazards, apparently, that, are, that we know about in danger, and, and much of the seed seems to go to waste. It never gets beyond there. Unless the Word of God gets to our heart, touches us deeply, or, or unless life circumstances batter us so that we begin to get the bright idea, maybe our plans for happiness, or our idea of it, is not so hot. At least it's not the last word after you wind up in the hospital, being in jail, after being in an alcoholic rehabilitation place, lost on drugs, have a few psychotic episodes, divorce three or four times, all your children hate you, you go bankrupt three or four times. Begin, you begin to get the idea, <laughs> gee, maybe my program, there's something wrong in my life, maybe this idea of, of having control over everybody or having as much pleasure as possible or having all the security in the world, maybe that, those things don't work after all. So here is where the gospel will give you a break. Instead of waiting for that to happen and having to begin life again at 60, 70, or 80, why not listen to the gospel? Listen, for God's sake. And it would save you so much trouble because the gospel says, in every form you can imagine, your programs for happiness that are selfishly based, however understandable, because they were put together in early childhood when you didn't have any reason, stink. They're no good. <laughs> Drop it. Drop, let them drop dead. And so the ascetical life is the dismantling <laughs> of unhappiness programs so that you can enjoy life. That's not a bad deal. Why do we complain? I don't know. It's just that we have the mindset that anything against our preconceived ideas is going to make us permanently unhappy. It, it will cause us to mourn because everything you love when it goes away, you feel sad for a while. But that mourning is actually creative if you accept it. Because when the mourning period is over, you now know that you can live without this object, community, money, possession, whatever it is. Or you can enter into a new relationship with it, which is more mature, liberating, and which does not reduce you to slavery and emotional dependency. <laughs>